and influence of God's word, but aren't you glad God promised us heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall last forever. Forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Someone said, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. The fact of the matter is, God said it, that settles it. Whether you believe it or not is up to you, but it doesn't change the truth. Amen. Take your Bibles and open it this morning to the book of John. The Gospel of John this morning will be in the second chapter of the Gospel of John. And I want to encourage you again, be back tonight in the evening service. I promise you won't want to miss it. You'll get a blessing out of it. And there is certainly uh, something in it for everyone tonight. So make sure you're here. And I want you to be here in the service this evening. If you're a guest with us this morning, thank you so much for being here. I hope you'll take the time to let us get to know you and you get to know us. And I believe you're in the best church around this morning. And uh, I know there are many other churches trying to do what God has given them to do. And that's not a uh, conflict with them or a, a condemnation of them. I just am glad I'm a part of this place. And I want you to be a part of wherever God has placed you. I do know this, that every Christian ought to be a part of a local church. And I, I believe it's important. You know, you, you need a church home. You need a place where you can be taught and preach the Word of God and allow the Word of God to influence your life. There are people sitting in this room this morning that live in this place, in this area, because they know this is the church God has given them. This is the place God has given them. I believe every one of us need a church home. Every one of us need a Christian home. You know, just because we're saved and born again and we know Jesus Christ is our Savior does not mean we have a Christian home. We need a Christian home. And my, how the world has tried to attack what God has established. The institution of marriage in the home was established all the way back in the very beginning of the book of Genesis. And then you need an eternal home. Every one of us have one, but you need the right eternal home. You need Jesus Christ as your Savior. By the way, the other two do not exist without Jesus. The church does not exist without Jesus. The Christian home does not exist without Jesus. The most important decision you will ever make, the most important decision I ever made, was the decision to understand that God loved me, that I was a sinner, and my sin had to be paid for. And Jesus Christ left heaven and came to this earth for one purpose, to die for sinners. Jesus died on a cross and He took my sin and He took your sin so that we didn't have to pay for it. And He offers to all men eternal life. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. For God so loved the world. That means every man, woman, boy, or girl that's ever lived, that is living or will ever live, God loved and gave Jesus for so that you might have eternal life. If you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, let me encourage you. God wants you to be saved today. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. We come to the book of John, the Gospel of John in chapter number 2. And uh, I want you to follow along with me. We'll begin reading in chapter 2 in verse number 12. We came to uh, this chapter last week. We began in the Gospel of John several weeks ago. And we're preaching through this book. And uh, we are... Uh, just concluded the miracle at the wedding of Canaan there. And uh, we made this statement last week that it is a wise person that, in all, that invites Jesus to their marriage. It's a wise person that invites Jesus to their, their marriage. By the way, I don't believe you do that just one time. I believe we have to ask the Lord for help every day. We have to ask God for guidance every moment of our life. And uh, we have to, as David said, daily... Ask the Lord to enable us, to strengthen us, to give us wisdom. We're living in a world today where we must navigate conflict. We must navigate a culture successfully. And the only way to do that is with the wisdom of the Word, the Word of God. So it's always a wise person that invites Jesus to be a part of whatever we're doing. And so we come to this passage this morning. The marriage is concluded. And the Bible tells us in verse number 12, And after this he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there 
not many days. Capernaum became the, Capernaum became the home of Jesus. And uh, it was a place that Jesus uh, addressed in the Gospels many times, or addressed in the Gospels, because of their lack of faith, the inability to trust the Lord and see great and mighty things done. And Jesus made His home there, but it was time for the Passover, verse number 13, and the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was actually located south of Capernaum, but geographically it was located at a higher elevation. And so the Bible says that Jesus went up to Jerusalem. The Bible tells us, and they and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers of money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise, and his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us? There's that question again. The religious crowd was always looking for a sign. Jesus, if you could just give us a sign, then, then we would believe. Jesus says, what sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. I want to preach to you this morning on this thought, the zeal of Jesus. The zeal of Jesus. The Bible tells us in references in the passage that we just read, the book of Psalms, I would like you to turn there if you would please, to Psalm 69. Psalm 69, it is a messianic psalm in reference to our Savior. And the Bible says the verse that was quoted in John there, the Gospel of John, is found in Psalm 69, and the Bible tells us, and let's begin reading in verse number 7, Because for thy sake I have borne reproach, shame hath covered my face. I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children, for the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. And the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. I wonder, as we go back to the Gospel of John from Psalm 69, I wonder as we consider the Lord Jesus Christ and we consider the zeal of Jesus, what is it that stirs our life? What is it that we are zealous about? What is, what is it that we are stirred about? What is it that we're on fire about? I could give many earthly examples of things that stir our heart, that things that stir our emotions. If you are uh, living in the world today and, and you have a television, many of you ladies uh, at this time of the year enjoy watching Hallmark movies. And the thing about a Hallmark movie is the plot is always the same, no matter how many thousands of them are made. My wife enjoys watching Hallmark movies, and I enjoy my wife, so I'll watch a Hallmark movie with her every two or three years. And, uh, and so I, I was sitting yesterday with my wife. There was a crowd of young people at our house, and, and I was sitting there just kind of being there with her, and, and she was watching a Hallmark movie. And the fact of the matter is, ladies can multitask. She was cooking lunch and cleaning the kitchen and watching the Hallmark movie. And I said, baby, I thought you were going to watch this movie. She said, I am. I said, no, you're not. You're cleaning the kitchen. You're, you're cooking dinner. And, and you're, not, you're missing the whole point. I know you've seen the point about seven times in the other previous movies. But you're missing this one. Same actor, different place, all kinds of good things. It's hilarious if you listen to my sons describe the plot of a Hallmark movie. <laughs> my wife says they always save the kiss for the end. And then that kiss comes and every woman that watches a Hallmark movie says, oh. And every man goes, thank God. <laughs> there are things in this culture that stir our emotions. Me, the Saturday before, I was stirred a little bit more. Of course, at the end, I went, oh. And my wife went, thank God. It's over until next year. Not quite yet. There are things that stir our emotions. But my question to you is this. What is it that you're zealous about? 
What is it that stirs your heart? What is it that makes you do what you do? The Bible says that Jesus is in, in the Messianic Psalm, in Psalm 69, in that Psalm, it is foretold that the zeal of the house of God would consume the Son of God. He would be consumed by the things of God. And the Bible tells us here that as he approaches Jerusalem, he finds the temple in disarray. He finds the circumstances of the house of God not to be something that is appealing to him. The Bible says he arrives and, and his zeal, his, his fire, his fervor for the things of God begin to stir in him. And listen to me, when you are zealous about something, when you are stirred about something, when you are motivated by something, it always produces an action in your life. There's always a result of zeal. There are many people who are zealous or stirred or motivated or focused on things that hold nothing of eternal value. There are many people who sit in churches today that are consumed with things that are simply temporary. I thought yesterday as I contacted several people in our church and people that I knew who had family members or friends or loved ones that lived in the Kentucky area. And I asked, how, how is your family? Is everything okay? Is there anything that we can do? You say, what do you see about the circumstance that we saw in Kentucky on last evening? Here's what you see. That the things of this world are temporary. They're here and they're gone. But there are many people who are living their life for things that are temporary. They're zealous about things that in eternity they matter for not. But Jesus is zealous about something that is eternal. I would much rather be connected to something that will endure than something that will implode. I would much rather be connected to something of eternal value than to be connected to something that will hold eventually no value. Jesus has connected his life, and you and I as Christians, as little Christ, as Christians, ought to be connected to things of eternal value. What we find out, though, in our life is when we connect ourselves to things that really don't matter, it brings emptiness. There are people who are sitting in church around, churches around the, the world today that are sitting and they're listening to the Bible being taught and the Word of God being preached, and on the inside they are asking themselves, what Am I really living for? It seems like we fight the same battles over and over again. We, we deal with the same disappointment. We go through the same trial. We try to get victory in the same area over and over again. And it seems like just over and over again, there's no success. There's no victory. There's no joy. Listen to me, friend. The Bible says about joy, you'll be able to see it on your countenance. You'll be able to see it in your face. As a man thinking in his heart, so is he. Listen, if you've got the joy of the Lord in your heart, it'll show in your life. But you know what happens often, so often in your life and in my life, is that we try to live for things that really hold no value. We try to be zealous about things that really in the, in the end are worth nothing. And we find nothing in those things but disappointment. There are many people who are trying to live a successful marriage without Jesus. And their, their life is discouraged. There are many people who are trying to find success in life, whether through a job or through relationships, and they're trying to find that success apart from Jesus, and they're disappointed. They're discouraged. They're defeated. As a matter of fact, in this day and age, in this time of the year, you'll find people literally at their wit's end, just not certain what to do next. Attach yourself to something of eternal value. Live for something far greater than you. Our culture is teaching our young people that are coming along. Our culture is teaching not just our young people, but our children that are growing up. Listen to me. Life is all about you. What you want, what you think, how you feel. It doesn't matter what truth is. That's relative. It doesn't matter how it affects other people. Just do what you want. And if it makes you happy, then that's okay. Friend, that is not a Bible principle. That is not something that will endure. That joy, that success, that pleasure, as the Bible says, is simply for a season. And then you find out you've lived for nothing. 
Jesus here is zealous about the things of God. He's zealous about the house of God. He is stirred about right. He is stirred about truth. I want you to see in his zeal, first of all, his love for the house of God. Look what the Bible tells us here. If we look in the passage in verse number 12, he says, And after this, he went down to Capernaum. He and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. They weren't there long, and they realized it was time to go to Jerusalem for the Passover. Jesus did not come to uh, abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law, and in this moment, he was setting the right example. But do you understand that the Capernaum and Jerusalem were separated by 70 to 90 miles? There was no Uber back then. There was no public transit. No airplane. The trip was taken on foot, most likely. It was a long trip. It was a tiring trip. But we see the love that Jesus had for the house of God by His commitment to going. Listen to me. Don't say that you love God and not come to His house. Don't say that we love the Lord and not be committed to His work. Don't say that we love God and allow everything else that wants to step in the way of what God desires to do to to take greater priority over the house of God. Listen to me. God's people ought to be first in line at the house of God. God's people ought to be in this place. When the church doors are open, you ought to want to be here. Why? Because we see about Jesus that He loved the house of God. 70 to 90 miles on foot didn't keep him from where he was supposed to be. We live in a culture today that any inconvenience or any scheduling conflict, any issue or any other option that is open to us, we immediately scratch out the house of God and replace it with whatever item is on our agenda. The Bible and God's word and God's house ought to be important to God's people. What are you living for? What are you living for? By the way, I would go a step further and say this. That if there's there's no desire in the heart of a Christian to be in the house of God, then there's a wrong desire in your heart. There's something in your heart that's not right. Many of us don't like to look into the mirror and see the faults. Many of us don't like to look into the the mirror and see the, the problems or the issues. But the fact is, when we look into the mirror of God's Word, you understand, you're not looking into a mirror that is, that is uh, deceiving. You are looking into a mirror that is truthful. And God is revealing truth about you. He's revealing truth about your life. His going. Can I say a step further? The Bible says here that when he got to the temple, he found it in disarray. And look at it, if you would, please, in verse 14. And he found the temp- found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money. Now mark this last word in the verse, sitting. He found them sitting. And look what the Bible says. And when he had made a scourge of small cords. Uh-oh. There's a problem. And it wasn't a problem the pastor identified. It wasn't a problem that some deacon or someone else identified. This problem Jesus identified. And here's what happens. When Jesus identifies a problem, he always addresses it. You know what the church has done today? You know what pastors and preachers have done today? We become content, Brother Matt, with identifying a problem. But never letting the Bible address it in our life. You know what Christians have done today? How many of us have said, you know what, I need to be a better witness. I need to give. By the way, you don't need to give because you feel like you need to give. You need to give because God commanded it. I need to give. You know, I need to be faithful. We've identified the problem, but the fact is we've never let the Word of God address it in our life. Because when God identifies a problem, He always addresses it. And the Bible says, look in the verse there, if you would, please. Brother Tim, you got your Bible there? I don't want to go back up there on the platform. It's too much work, all right? (laughs) Look in verse 14. I'm sorry, verse verse 14. And he found the temple and those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and changers of money sitting. And look in verse 15. And when he had made Jesus' zeal for the house of God was revealed in his going, but it was also revealed in his giving. He took something that he possessed and made something that God could use. He took something that he possessed 
and made something, gave something that God could use. You know, every blessing that I have and every blessing that you have is not there because of who you are. Do you understand that the family that you've been given, you didn't get on your own? Do you understand that the job that you have, you did not just arrive there of your own volition and free will? Do you understand that as a Christian, every good gift comes from above? And God says, what are you doing for me with the gift that I have given you? What are you doing for the Lord with the gift that I have given you? Do you understand that the greatest gift that we have, follow me please, do you understand the greatest gift that we have, the greatest asset that we have in serving God is the life that He's giving us? Do you understand? Everybody with me, on the count of three, take a deep breath. One, two, three. Hold it. Breathe out. Do you understand that breath came from God? Do you understand that without that, it won't take long and you'll fall asleep? Every gift comes from God. And the greatest asset you have is the life that God has given you. So my question is, what are you doing with your life that God can use? Jesus had a purpose in what he was making. Jesus had a purpose in what he was going to use that, that scourge for. He, he had a purpose in, in what he was going to use that, those cords for. He had a purpose in it. And by the way, God has a purpose for your life. Don't buy into this idea that the Christian life is just coming to church. Don't be deceived by a, 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 a contemporary movement. And when I say that, I'm talking about error of time in which we live. Don't be deceived by a contemporary movement that says, listen, just check a box and punch a button. Do your church thing on Sunday, then live any way you want to. No, my God is much bigger than that. We see His love for the house of God, His zeal for the house of God and His going we see it in His giving, but thirdly, we see His zeal for the house of God in His guarding. What does the Bible say here? Look at what Jesus does. The Bible says, and when He made the scourge of small cords, look what, it, look what the Bible says, please. He drove them all out of the temple. He drove them all out of the temple. I told you to mark the last word of verse Number 15, and we find it to be this uh, verse number 14, this word sitting. But I promise you, when Jesus began to deal with them, they weren't sitting. The Bible says he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers of money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold dove, take these things hence. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. They went from sitting and, 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 and being served to being moved by God. By the way, stop for just a moment. Please don't miss this. God will do whatever it takes to get your attention. Some moms and dads in this room, you better sit up and pay attention and listen to what this preacher is saying. God will do whatever it takes to get your attention. The Bible says he drove those things out that weren't supposed to be there. And we're going to get to why he drove them out in just a moment. But I want you to understand something. We are, we are living in a culture today where we have become more comfortable with inviting things into the house of God that have no business being in the house of God. We have, we have developed church so it looks more like the culture rather than allowing the church to change the culture. That's the way it ought not be. And sometimes God has to clean house. Sometimes God has to say, it's time to wake up, get your attention, pay attention to what's going on. By the way, stop for just a moment. If we're going to be a clean church, we've got to be clean Christians. A church is not a building. By the way, I thought about this this morning. Those pastors and churches in Kentucky that were planning to go to church today that have no place to meet now. They have no building to go into. You say, so what are they going to do? The church is still the church. Amen. Listen, here's, here's the sad truth. If our building was gone today, how many of us would show up to sit and fold a chair? How many of us would so, show up to, to, to help set chairs up or to, to pick up branches or to remove sides of buildings and clean up things so that the church could gather? 
Jesus will do whatever it has to do to get our attention. You say, Pastor, what, why, would you, why would you say something like this? By the way, stop. This isn't me speaking. This is the Word of God. And you ought to consider God's warning in your life in this moment nothing but grace. We see His zeal for the house of God in His going. We see it in His giving. We see it in His guarding. You ought to guard your church. Do you understand the Bible has already given a promise to the church? Jesus already promised upon this rock. It wasn't Peter, by the way. It was Peter's confession that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. That rock is what the church is built upon. And Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In other words, the devil can't ruin it from the outside. The devil can't affect it on the outside. But when we bring the devil in, that wolf in sheep's clothing, you ought to guard your church. See, how do I guard my church? You do it the same way you guard your heart. Keep thy heart with all diligence. For out of, the, for out of it are the issues of life. Guard what you allow into your life. How do things get in your, in your heart? They get there through your eye gate. They get there through your ear gate. Be careful what you look at. Be careful what you listen to. In guarding your heart, you'll guard your church. You'll guard your church. You are to guard your brothers and sisters in Christ. You are to guard them. Can you imagine, Brother Abram, if, I, if you were at home and an intruder began to come into your home. You would do all that you could to protect your wife and three sons. You know what the devil does when he tries to influence your heart about your church? He's really not trying just to destroy you. He wants to destroy your church. And you ought to fight like crazy to keep him out of it. You ought to pray for your church. You ought to participate in your church. Amen. Amen. We see his zeal for the house of God through his going. We see his zeal through his giving. We see his zeal through his guarding. We see the zeal of Jesus. Why was he so zealous? Secondly, I'll give you the second point. I won't preach the third one this morning, but I will preach it next week. We see his zeal not only for the house of God, but we see his zeal and love for all men. Why is this so important? Look what the Bible tells us. Where do we get this from? Look what the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us, and you can take the time to, to study this in the other Gospels. I'm not going to do it this morning. But the Bible says in verse 15, And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them, out of, drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers of money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold dove, Take these hints. Make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And, he re- and his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten him up. Why did Jesus run him out? Well, if you take the time to study it, where these money changers had set up their merchandise was in the court of the Gentiles, the outer court. The Jews had the inner court. The Gentiles were on the outer court. They were on the outside looking in. And Jesus made the point in driving out everything that was unnecessary. He made the point to the religious crowd of the day that this is not reserved for man's ideas. As a matter of fact, get get it this way. In this moment, in this moment, he he, he recognized that the religious crowd, the religious crowd, the the church-going crowd, had replaced the true purpose of the house of God. They had written their own agenda. It was really set up as something that was innocent because people would travel far and they would come to offer sacrifice, but because of the length of travel, can you imagine traveling 70, 90 miles by foot? Because of the length of travel, they would come and outside of the temple, they would be able to purchase a sacrifice, either a dove or a sheep. Uh, They would be able to purchase that sacrifice and then go in and offer that sacrifice. But man had had come to the conclusion that this could become a money-making plan for us. 
And making money in the court of the Gentiles became more important than men and women coming to the temple. And the reason that Jesus Christ was so infuriated when he got to the temple is he said, you've replaced the true purpose of the temple with your own agenda. This court was designed for the souls of men and women, boys and girls to come. This, was, this place was designed so that people could meet Jesus. And I enjoy all the things that the church has an opportunity to do. I want to throw as many lines in the water for Jesus as I can. But I don't want to do anything that is going to hinder the true purpose of God in this place. I don't want to fill up the court with so many things that we're trying to do that men and women, boys and girls can't come to Jesus. We're too busy to witness. We're too busy to share the gospel. We're too busy to disciple new Christians. We're too busy to teach the Word of God to the next generation. And listen to me, your young people, they're being taught things today that you and I never heard of when we were growing up. And it's being drugged into their life. It's being promoted in their life. It's being shoved down their throat. And I promise you this, if you just leave them alone and let it figure it out on their own, they're going to be taught things you wish they'd never learned. Get them in the house of God and let the Bible change their life. His love for all men. They replaced the true purpose of the church with man's agenda. May God help us to be a church that's consumed, that's zealous about one thing. And that is only what God wants. That is only the gospel message of Jesus Christ. What changes a man? Do you understand you can come to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night and never be any different? You can know, I know people that know more about the Bible than any preacher I know. And they're as carnal as can be. They have a knowledge. The Bible warns us that knowledge puffs up. It's not enough to know about God. The question this morning is this, do you know Him? You see, the purpose of church is not so that you can just come and know about God, but so that you can know God. We see His zeal for all men. You know what Jesus wanted? He wanted you. Listen to me. If you're in here this morning and you're not 100% Jew, you know what you are? You're a Gentile. Every one of us. You know what Jesus said? You know why he cleared the court? You know why he ran him out of the temple? Because he said, I want Brian Cooper to have an opportunity to know God. I want Marcos to have an opportunity to know the Lord. I, I, I want this family. I want this person who's hanging on by a thread. And, and they, they seem like and life has thrown them a curve. And everybody else has rip, written them off. And, and just looks like there's no hope. But they walk into the house of God. And they find out that God loves them. He said, I ran them out because I want you to know Jesus. And I want you to know Jesus. And I want you to know Jesus. And I want you to know Jesus. I want you to know, to know what it means to have a God that loves you. He was zealous about the house of God. He was zealous with his love for all men. What are you living for? What are you living for this morning? Is, are you content with knowing about God? On Sunday nights, we have our children line up and they quote Bible verses. Say, Pastor Brian, why do, you, why do you encourage those children at a young age to learn those Bible verses? Because I promise you, they're going to need Bible in their life. I want them to know that when they're tempted by the devil. By the way, moms and dads, if you have children sitting in this room, you have children that are in one of the other three services that are taking place on this property, if you have children in one of those classes, I promise you the devil knows where they are. No doubt in a crowd this size, there are young people dealing with things that no one else knows about. Say, so who's going to help them when they're in that battle 
by themselves. I'll tell you who will help them. It will be the God that helped them remember that scripture. It will be the Holy Spirit that gave them those words. When Jesus was taken up and, and, and tempted by the devil in the wilderness, what did he do? He began to quote scripture. Live for something worth living for. Don't waste your life. Imagine getting to the end. I don't know how it's going to be. I have an idea of what the scripture says, but you know, God can do whatever he wants to do. Imagine getting to heaven as a Christian. Because once I become a child of God, there's nothing I can do to lose that. My salvation is not based upon a pre-selection process. Somebody say amen right there. For God so loved the world, all men have an opportunity to be saved. So how am I going to go to heaven? You'll go to heaven because of one reason. You accepted Jesus Christ, the end. There are not many ways to heaven. I don't care what Oprah said. My dad used to always say that. I don't care what Oprah says. There's one way to heaven. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There are not many ways to heaven. There's one way. What are you living for? Live for something worth living for. Don't waste your life on things that do not matter. We don't know how it's going to be. As I said already, God can do whatever he wants to. But can you imagine getting to heaven and God showing us what could have been had we lived for his purpose? You're not going to change the world with the money you make. You're not going to change the world with a song that's sung. You're not going to change the world with, a, with an agenda. You're not going to change the world because of your fame or fortune or popularity. You'll never change the world with that. But what we can change the world with, this, with is this, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not our message. It's God's message. We're just a vehicle that God uses for a moment. And that moment's called life. So my question to you this morning is this. In this life, what are you living for? Lord, we love you today. I thank you that you love us. I thank you that you care for us. I thank you that you have blessed us beyond what we deserve. And Lord, I ask today as we come to this invitation, I ask today, God, that you would work in the hearts and lives of people. I pray for husbands and wives and moms and dads and teenagers and children. I pray, God, if there's one here that doesn't know you as Savior, that today would be the day of salvation in their life. Now would be the accepted time. God, I ask that you do in their life what no man can do. I pray for Christians today. Lord, we, we preach a message like this, and every one of us must look into the mirror of your word and realize God, there's, there's some things that need to be corrected. I, I, I want to live for an eternal purpose. I, I want to have a zeal for God. And I want to be zealous about things that matter in eternity. God, would you speak to the heart of your children? Would you speak to Christians this morning, church members? God, may you do a work in their life. God, we give this invitation to you and ask that you bless. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes